الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Brother Chairman our distinguished fellow panelists Dr. Omar Zaid uh, whose presentation I was looking forward to listening to for a long time and he's not disappointed me. Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, and I also have two grandsons here and perhaps a future son-in-law as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. An introduction to Islamic eschatology. And how do we link it to the presentation on the occult, on the secret societies, on the symbolism which symbolizes so much evil? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the very beginning of Surah Al Hadid of the Quran, the Surah entitled Iron and Steel He says بَعَدْ أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ هُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ وَزَاهِرُ وَالْبَاطِنِ إِلَىٰ أَخِلِ الْآيَةِ He is the first and the last and that which is manifest and also that which is hidden indicating that if we are to penetrate truth for he is truth he is al haq if we are to penetrate truth and if we are to penetrate truth as it moves in the historical process it cannot be a part time piecemeal effort you got to link the beginning with the end and you got to link that which is outside with that which is hidden and what Islamic eschatology does is precisely to link the beginning with the end and to link the external with the internal it's not an, e an easy subject. You need a multidisciplinary scholarship to handle Islamic eschatology or Ilmu Akhiru Zaman because the end cannot be understood without reference to the beginning. In the 35, 30 minutes that I want to take with you. I want to show you how this is done. It is not possible. It was not possible for those who were there at the time of the beginning, at the time of the first shower who were the companions of the Prophet it was not possible for them to be able to encompass the totality of knowledge which was communicated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. 
many of whose ahadith pertain also to that which is hidden and that which comes at the end. But we who live in the end times, we have no excuse. We have a job to do that they could not do. And this is not because of any deficiency on their part, but because of an unavailability of the data that you need. And so if your methodology is that knowledge comes only from the Quran and from the Hadith and from the early, the Aslaf, and you will not accept any knowledge of Islam which comes after that, we say to you, we said, but we're moving on. We can't stay with you. We're moving on. No bad feelings. No need for boxing gloves. Ours is a, a different methodology from yours. We're not throwing stones at you. But we are warning that you judge a tree by the fruit which it produces. And if our methodology can explain the reality of the world today, it will validate our effort. Here is a stunning example of the link between al awwal and an akhir with which Islamic eschatology is concerned. At the very beginning of religion, and of course religion began with Ibrahim alayhi salam Milla to Ibrahim the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to him a vision and then he came to his son Ismail alayhi salam there's no doubt about that that it was Ismail alayhi salam Ya Bunaya O oh my son I have surely seen in my sleep, in a vision, that I must sacrifice you. Son, how do you respond? Do you agree to this sacrifice? <coughs> Ya abatif al ma tu'mar Oh my father, go ahead, do as you have been ordered. Meaning, we both recognize that this is from Allah. I agree to the sacrifice. I hope Egypt is listening today. I hope the Arabs are listening today. I hope those who have come from Ismail alayhi salam are listening today. For Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said, the best of those who came from Ismail alayhi salam are the Kinana. And the best of those who came from the Kinana are the Quraysh. And the best of the Quraysh are Banu Hashim. And I am the best of Banu Hashim. In other words, declaring the line that the Arabs have come from Ismail alayhi salam. And so he said, Ya, ab ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Oh my father, go ahead. Go ahead. I accept the sacrifice. But when Ibrahim alayhi salam, and I don't know what is in his heart, if we meet him one day, inshallah, we can ask him. There could be far more to what he did than what we understand. When he put his son's head on the block to sacrifice it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called out to him, Ya Ibrahim, by name, eh? Ya Ibrahim, Qad Sadaqta Ru'ya. You have already accepted, submitted, fulfilled the vision. What I've asked of you, what I've asked of you did not require that you take a knife 
and cut the throat of your son? No, that was not what I asked of you. What I've asked of you has already been accepted and has already been fulfilled. What could it be? If al awwal is linked with al akhir, then this sacrifice, this vision of sacrifice of Ibrahim, the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, from whom the Arabs have come. It could mean, and Allah knows best, that this is a communication at the very beginning of an event that is to take place at the end. The sacrifice of the Arabs. And the Arabs today are being, prop are being prepared for that moment of sacrifice which is coming. How can we stand up here and say that the Arabs are going to be sacrificed in a momentous sacrifice when all the indicators are to the opposite? That this is the Arab Spring, the winter is gone, dictatorship is gone, persecution and oppression is gone. And we are now free once again. And Islam, the religion, is rising once again. And we will triumph over those who have been oppressing us and waging war on Islam. That is the external. And we are saying that the internal is different. Time will tell. And we don't have long to wait. to know whether or not this is a valid thesis or hypothesis. We don't have long again to wait. That there is a momentous sacrifice of the Arabs which is coming. And Ibrahim alayhi salam saw it, knew it was going to come. His seed, his progeny from this son and he accepted it. And Ismail alayhi salam knew also that this is what's going to come and he also accepted it. And so next Sunday, when we sacrifice our animals, and don't tell me you're going to write a check, not even the pagan Arabs who worship idols made of wood and stone would ever do such an act of profound disrespect and disregard for the Sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam as to write a check. No, they sacrifice the animal with their own hands. And when they sacrifice the animals with their own hands, and there was blood on their hands, and blood in their clothing, then Allah spoke to them and said, It is not this which will read Allah. It is not this blood and flesh of the animals which will reach Allah. But where is the blood today? I don't see any blood on a check. It is the piety in your hearts that will reach Allah. Is there a great sacrifice of the Arabs that is coming? <clears throat> Seven months ago, six months ago, when I gave my lecture at the University of Malaya, an Islamic view of the current Arab uprisings, <coughs> I laid down the hypothesis there that this is the preparation for the great slaughter. That what the enemy is planning is to be able to say to the world that Islam is rising again. And so when the Tunisian elections, when the recent Tunisian elections delivered to the Islamic party victory, and when the elections in Egypt which are to be due next month I believe, delivers predictably so victory to the Islamic parties. And when the domino effect takes place around the Arab world and when the call for the enforcement of Sharia finds roots then Israel will be able to say and all the media that supports Israel will be able to say Islam is now rising again posing a threat not only to Israel but posing a threat to the world posing a threat to mankind, demonizing Islam, painting Islam 
as a menace and hence establishing justification for the great wars which have already been planned with which Israel will be able to expand her territorial frontiers. But we know that subject already from my book, Jerusalem and the Quran, and set a trap for the United States. So that the United States will be facing military defeat, it's not just the collapse of the US dollar and collapse of the US economy, but more than that for Israel to replace the United States. Mm -hmm. But we have a question and answer session where we can elaborate on that but from the time we ask the question why would Israel want to do these things and we get the answer that Israel wants to rule the world but when they said in Europe that all that we want to do is to provide a home for the Jewish people and they issued the Balfour Declaration in 1917. We say that was a lie. We are now accustomed to your lies. You are a people who tell monstrous lies. And truth does not reside in the heart of those from whose lips lies constantly emerge. Even a schoolboy would understand that. What you wanted to do was to create a state that would rule the world. And Israel is just a few steps away from that. Israel cannot rule the world, however, unless it first establishes its political and economic dominion over the Arab world. How can we explain this without reference to Dajjal? How can we explain this without reference to Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Majuj, which are major signs of Akhiru Zaman? And yet, our critics are emphatic that no, the Jal has not been released. Gog and Magog have not been released. If we can't find a barrier built by Zulkarnay, which is made of iron and steel, it's probably somewhere down a few miles underneath the earth. Is that scholarship? We do not want to disrespect our critics. But we say if you are not prepared to accept that Dajjal is the mastermind of the modern age and that Gog and Magog are the means through which Dajjal pursues his mission on the earth, then we're very sorry, we're moving on. We can't wait on you. From the time you turn to Dajjal, you turn to the internal knowledge, to the occult. And you also turn to the importance of symbolism, which is where Dr. Omar Zaid is so precious to us, because he's done the research that we could not do. And may Allah bless him to continue with that research. But these two have to be brought together. The first and the last, the outer and the inner. An example of symbolism, and it's there in the Hadith, and from the time I'm finished, the questions are going to be posed to Dr. Zaid, I know, right away. Dajjal sees with his left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. Can you imagine the number of questions that are going to come now? <laughs> For Dr. Zaid. Between his eyes on his forehead, he's written the word, Kafir, and every mu'min will be able to read it. Whether he is katib, literate, or ghayru katib, illiterate. I leave that symbol with you. Back 
to the slaughter. We say that the Arabs are being prepared for a great slaughter. Is there anything else beside that vision of Ibrahim alayhi salam to support this thesis? Yes, there is. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he woke up from his sleep when the hadith is located in Sahih Bukhari in several different versions from several different sources companions. So we say it is mutawatir. He woke up from his sleep. What he had seen in his sleep, also a vision like Ibrahim alayhi salam, was so terrible, so terrible, that his face was red, flushed, red. It has to be something terrible for the Prophet of Allah to wake up with his face all red, flushed red. What did he see? He woke up and he spoke these memorable lines. He said, Arab min sharrin Woe unto the Arabs because of an evil Shar, an evil. It can't be an ordinary evil for his face to be so flush red. It has to be a very great evil, which is now close. And then he raised his hands like this and he said, Today. <coughs> Today means this day or 1000 years from now. Where has reason fled? He said, Today. A hole has been made in the radam. He didn't use the word sad, he used the word radam. Surah Al Kaf has both the words. When they ask Zulkarnain to build it, they use the word sad. When he built it, he used the word radam. And the hadith says the radam of Zulkarnain, of Yajuj and Majud. Today, a hole has been made indicating that the great evil which is going to devastate the Arabs has not as yet occurred. It is an end time event because the words Gog and Magog are there. What is this great catastrophe that is coming on the Arabs? What is this great destruction that is coming on the Arabs which has not as yet come? Where is Islamic scholarship today? Why are you not asking these questions? And I'm not asking the Malay ulama. I'm not asking the Indonesian ulama. I'm asking the Arab ulama. She asked, Who? Zainab. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. Anuhlika. Will we be destroyed? Anuhlika, halaka, to destroy. Huh? Will we be destroyed? This is the word she asked. Will we, the Arabs, be destroyed when there are righteous people amongst us? The hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. He said, Naam, yes. And then he went on to use words I never understood until recently. Until I saw the pathetic state of Islamic scholarship today. And the even pathetic state of those who lead Muslims today. He said, When the scum prevails, then it will come. And today, the scum prevails. They have eyes and yet they cannot see. They have ears and yet they cannot hear. They have hearts and yet they do not understand. They're worse than cattle. They are the scum. And when the scum prevails, then the destruction of the Arabs, not the Malay, not the Turks, the Arabs 
will take place. We have something more than that, with which we should be looking again at Al Jazeera and CNN and reading the newspapers. <coughs> Dr. Zaid, I don't have a television set in my home and I don't buy the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you have my blessing. I sleep, I sleep peacefully at night. I sleep peacefully at night. Yes. No television and no newspapers. And I sleep peacefully. And my food can digest. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> he said, and the hadith is in Tirmizi, in Ibn Majah, Abdullah ibn Amr reported that the Messenger of Allah said there will come a calamity which will wipe out the Arabs and their slain will be in hell and at that time the tongue will be more severe in this than the blow of a sword Al Jazeera is more powerful than a cruise missile yes. CNN is more powerful than a helicopter gunship yeah the information media will be far more powerful than a sword he said there will be civil strife which will render people deaf dumb blind regarding what is right how can we explain they say we are Mujahideen in Libya they say he was a dictator, Muammar Gaddafi. They say we have the right to rise up against the oppressor. And yet these dumb and deaf and blind chose to make an alliance with NATO, the Zionist NATO, with which the Turkish Prime Minister is still comfortable. I've never heard the Turkish Prime Minister say that he's anyway discomforted with Turkey's participation in NATO. I invite him to respond. How can you make an alliance that Allah has prohibited? Are you not aware of the Quran in which Allah prohibited? That when the Christian Jewish Zionist alliance emerges, you are prohibited from being friends and allies of such people? Woe unto the Arabs, the Hadith is in Abu Dawood. Woe unto the Arabs because of an evil which is growing, drawing close. The shadow has fallen on the Lord of the Kaaba. The shadow has fallen on them by the Lord of the Kaaba. The shadow has fallen upon them, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. These are a hadith pertaining to the destruction of the Arabs, which if we are correct, is now at hand not long from now. So we don't have long to wait to determine whether our methodology is correct and validated or wrong and invalidated. Just wait and see. Before we end, we still have another one minute. The Quran actually begins with a warning. 20 verses of the Quran at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, at the very beginning, which are devoted to three kinds of people. Five of the 20, the believers. Two of the 20, those who reject the faith, the kuffar. Five and two make seven. So 13 left, that's a lot. Who are those for whom 13 verses are Allocated. Women and Nasima Yakulu Aman Nabilahi Wabil Yomil Akhiri Wama Humimini. Allah speaks of a people who declare we are Christians, we are Jews, we are people who believe in Allah on the last day, but Allah says, No, they're not. They're not. They have trademarks. Yukhadiun Allah, Waladina Amanu. Their trademark is deception. When it is said to them, do not cause facade on earth, they say, no, we are the peacemakers. You're familiar with that, aren't you? When it is said to them, believe in the way these believers believe, they look down upon us and say, these are sufaha. We are the civilized people. 
We are the civilized people. We have the burden of civilizing these natives. But then the Quran goes on to say, وَإِذَا لَكُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When they are with those who have faith, they say, but we have faith like you. وَإِذَا لَكُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ الشَّيَاطِينِهِمْ There you are, Dr. Zayn. But when they are with their shayateen, Allah is giving you a very, very, very big hint here that these are people with links to the occult world. These are people with links to the jinn who are shayateen. Qalu inna ma'akum inna ma nahnu mustahzi'un And so the Quran is telling you to pay attention to that branch of knowledge to which we were just introduced this morning by Dr. Zaid. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless those <coughs> who now devote attention to the subject of Islamic eschatology, ilmu akhiru zaman, and that Allah may open our hearts that we might understand and penetrate that which is in the Quran and that which is in the word of the Prophet. صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتبع علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين. This eye business has several levels, but when you get to the highest level, it's actually the lowest. It's the exact opposite of the divine order. As given by Allah, Subhanahu wa Taala, and you can trace, <coughs> you can trace the development of this divine order and the development of this eye of Darjal uh, from the beginnings of what uh, Musa wrote in uh, what's called Genesis. But to get to the bottom line of this eye business. There's two, two aspects that you need to understand. One is called the illumination. And this is a direct perception of the world of the jinn and sharing that knowledge. Well, the jinn have a tremendous amount of knowledge and they have gifts which uh, humans do not have. And of course, humans have gifts which jinn do not have. And most of the gifts which we have, we have not actually actualized. We haven't followed the, the true teachings of the great masters like uh, Al-Ghazali. I mean, he mapped out the stages of purification, but these stages of purification are not, are not meant to lead to sanctimony. And sanctimony is what we're presented with as Islam today, and it's the same thing that the Pope presents in the Catholic Church. It's an outward rather than an inward. The eye represents the inward seeing of the occult world and is crossing the dimensions uh, between the uh, man and jinn, which is, uh, it, I, I think that, you know, it's essentially for, forbidden. I mean, I would have to defer to the sheikh's knowledge here, but I think it's forbidden territory. But these men and women who do this, they have such impunity, they care not about this forbidden area. They want to reach out and take this knowledge, okay? If it's not given to them, handed to them as a gift by Allah, they want to go and take it. This is the, the building of the Tower of Babylon. That's what it means symbolically. So this eye represents, you know, to, make, to bring it home here, it's the eye of the Bomo, okay? And it's the eye of the unknown. It's knowledge of the unknown. Well, the Quran is very clear on this. Uh, and I have to um, <clears throat> forgive me if I don't quote it uh, exactly, uh, but it says, uh, I know what you do not know, <laughs> okay? And I share my knowledge with those whom I choose to share it with, not whom you choose to try and take it from me with, you see? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, Shay, but that's the essential meaning. Allah does not choose share his secret knowledge with somebody because they've chosen to take it. Okay? 
Uh, but these magicians, the Majus, they have chosen to take that knowledge. And so what does Allah do? Allah hands them over to the jinn. And Iblis said, hey, I'm going to be before him, behind him, above him, on all sides, and I'm going to take him down. Yeah, and Allah said, go ahead. But those who are my servants, you cannot touch. And that's your protection. You see? Now, there's another understanding of this eye. And that eye is, it also represents, if you look at the eye as it's represented on the U.S. dollar bill, it has this reptilian quality. Yeah. And what is this reptilian quality? Well, it reserves, it's reserved for the very basic uh, subhuman instincts of the reptile. There's a very ancient part of the, um, the chain of events that uh, had led to the creation of mankind. If you look at a serpent, the reptile, if you look at a lizard, it's a reptile. What does it do? Is it a loving, caring creature? No. It's cold-blooded, self-serving. It is subhuman. Okay? Completely and totally subhuman and self-serving. And when you study Satanism, that is what it is. I am God. I, Alistair Crowley said it, do what you will. The Beatles came out and said it, do it, you know, if it feels good, do it. And all of that came, the 60s revolution in rock music was all the result of this occult movement and influence. This is called the New Age movement. Do it if it feels good, if it feels good, do it. Don't listen to your parents, don't listen to your teachers. If you want to go out and have sex, if you want to get drunk, you go ahead and do it. And so the reptilian instinct is being promoted to the masses while the magi, intellectual aspect, is being promoted to the masters. The 60 million I told you about. And it's only, not, not all 60 million of those are masters. Just a 1% uh, of that, okay? If that much. So they represent the occult eye this eye at the top of the pyramid, which is just about ready to have the capstone laid on by al Dajjal. And that's there on the back of the seal of the United States from the foundation of this revolution. All of these revolutions that are taking place now are based on we want what's good for us and we'll decide what's good for us. You don't know it. What's good for us, we're going to take over. And uh, this is the French Revolution all over again. And that the hand of Iblis is knocking all of these Arab leaders down, all of these Muslim leaders down, one after another. And believe me, they're all shaking in their boots right now because they don't really know who's next. They don't know who's next. And I happen to endorse Sheikh Hussein's position. There is a great judgment coming. Uh, and I say judgment, you see. Because the dream foretold a judgment. A judgment why? You need to understand this. Just as a woman who submits to a wicked man has all sorts of bad things happen to her and her children, so do the same things happen to a people who subject themselves to a wicked leadership. And even worse will happen to those who make partners with the enemies of their religion. And that is what's happening. Imagine that you're married to a man, but you're secretly sleeping with his enemy. Okay? What's going to happen to you? Is that man really going to love you? I don't think so. He's going to use you until he can bring down his enemy. And that's what's happening throughout the Islamic world right now. This is what's taking place. You have to know, understand, that these people are governing our academic institutions. They determine what is taught, what's not taught. And what you heard here, they have determined, will not be taught. That's a very serious statement I just made. 
so they don't want you to know. They don't want you to know. This is a very serious time, and this judgment is coming. That woman who's doing, the, the people, they're praying. They're praying five times a day. So are the Cistercian monks. They even pray more than that. Is prayer, does prayer make you a Muslim? No. It does not. And they fund your institutions that keep you praying. But keep you away from Islam. That's what they want. So the more religious you are, the more prayers you are, you give, the better you feel. And the whole time that they're doing that, they're also robbing you and getting ready to take you down. Yeah. So what these people do, they have submitted to equal, they have submitted to wicked leaders, and this is a judgment coming upon the Arabs. And what has happened in Iraq, Iraq is a judgment upon those people. Where is the God of Abraham? Where is the God of Muhammad? You'll hear this over and over again. Where is he? What does the scripture say? The scripture says, if you don't obey me, I'm not going to protect you. There is no protection for those who don't obey. It's a very simple scientific fact. So if you are submitted to wicked leaders who are not obeying, then you're not obeying. You see, what's happening in countries like this and other countries would never have happened in the day of the Sahaba. That's why when the hole opened, it also opened for secret societies to kill the first five or six just haters. They were all murdered by secret societies, most of which were affiliated with the Iranians and the Jews. <coughs> the Jews out of Egypt in particular. <coughs> This is all part of our cult history. And you don't learn this when you go to traditional Islamic schools. They don't teach this anymore. It's been erased from the history. So that you don't know. So that you don't know. So that those who follow the Fatimids don't know that the father of the Fatimids was a Jew. A crypto Jew. He was not a Muslim. He was not even a Shia. He was the father of a secret occult society like I just determined, uh, told you. So these people follow the lizard's eye. They're self-serving and they use magic to satisfy their appetites. Their appetites. Very serious question, very serious answer. You need to understand that these people have the heart and the cold blood of the reptile, the crocodile from the Nile, the Merovigian father of a satanic race that has powers which are in fact superhuman. They cannot be dealt with without the protection of Allah. And from what I see in most of the Muslim world, that protection is not forthcoming. Now I'll end my answer there. This movement is not spontaneous. Um, it is something that has been planned. You can think of it like a, a, a man who um, uh, prepares a bonfire. Okay, he chops the wood, he gets, piles it in a certain way, and he uh, sets the tinder around the base in a certain way, and then he waits for the correct time to make sure that the wood is all dry and ready for fire, and then he lights the tinder. Okay? What has been, what has come, this is work, fire worship. Okay? This is a metaphysical mystery. You can do to a group of people the same thing you can do to a pile of wood. You just need to know what Henry Kissinger said. You need to know how to manage the people. And magic and through symbolism is one of the ways in which people are, mag uh, are managed. I just answered uh, a question to uh, one of the uh, uh, friends here who uh, I said, well, you know, I've seen in this country your entire armed services on parade giving the Nazi salute. If you look at Hamas, they give the Nazi salute. If you look at Hezbollah, they give the Nazi salute. What's the difference? What's the difference? That's a common denominator there. Is this salute Nazi? No, it's Roman. He comes from Rome. 
the entire Muslim world is being conditioned. And so when you've got a bunch of people, they've been giving this Nazi salute since the uh, 1930s in the Middle East, by the way. It's been a long time being kindled. It's been a long time to light this flame. They transfer the job just like the Chinese transfer from father to son. They transfer the metaphysical magic and the symbols and how to use and how to manage them from father to son to father to son. That's what the skull and bones is all about. There's not a, there's not a major leader in American politics that hasn't some direct association with the skull and bone society for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And that society has a long history that goes back to Britain. America is ruled by Britain, and Britain is ruled by Rome. You need to understand that. I didn't get to half of the slides that I prepared for you. So, in order to understand this conditioning, what's happening now is that the, the, the worldwide, the Kindle has been, the, the Tinder has been laid. The logs have been cut, they're dry, everything's been set, they just light the fire, and then they spread the word, and they use Al Jazeera, they use CNN, they use the newspapers, they tell you what horrible atrocities are taking place, da 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 everybody gets fired up, and who's getting fired up? A bunch of ignorant people who think they know it all, and think that God's on their side. Yeah? Whether you're Shia, or Sunni, or whatever you are. I didn't see Shia or Sunni in the Quran when I read the translation. I saw Muslim. I didn't see it. All of that is sectarianism. You become a sectarian, I didn't see Malay Islam. I saw Islam. I saw Muslim. You practice sectarianism, you lose the protection of Allah. The moment you do that, the moment you do that, grace is gone. The roof over your head is gone. This is why some of the Sahaba, when there were civil wars, they stayed home. Because they were sectarian wars. It was chaos. Who brought the chaos? The same people who are bringing you the Occupy movement. The same magical groups. The same secret society. The same Satanists. Father to son, to father to son, to daughter to mother to daughter. These people are wicked. And they think they have the right to rule over you. They think they have the right to your pocket. And you've given it to them. You've submitted to an income tax, haven't you? The income tax is not. It's not Islamic. It's their system. In the United States, income tax is a completely illegal entity. It's being enforced by a mob called the IRS. That's who they are. And they are legally in a correct position, but even though they're illegal, because they get you to sign on a piece of paper that says, I voluntarily make this contribution. <laughs> See, that's your, your 1040 form or whatever it is that you fill out. You can rescind all of that. You get a birth certificate number, that number belongs to the Queen. You become a chapel of the Queen because Washington, D.C. is not the government. It is a corporation. The whole system is satanic. It's out in the open. You only have to learn how to read the signs. You read the fine print because that's where the devil is in the details. That's where he is. This Occupy movement has been planned for a long time and is spreading like a fire. And what they want in the States I'll tell you what they want in the States, and then uh, let the, the, the Sheikh back me up with his traditional knowledge. What they want in the States is they've been arming the inner hip-hop groups. You know. these, these guys, you know, Michael Jackson set them all up, okay? Uh, they, they're, they're better armed than the police, okay? They want the police and these hip-hop gangsters to go have a go at each other. They're setting the Tinder right now. It doesn't take long to have a riot. You just need the right temperature in the crowd. And then all hell breaks loose. The police come in, the gangsters come out, 
They start shooting each other. There's no rice in the in the market anymore. All right. They want to bring in the NATO troops. The Chinese troops are already in Texas. They're going to bring in foreign troops and take over the country that way. America has gone down the tubes. It's gone. America was carjacked during World War I and all of the car was dismantled and sold for parts. It's too late. It cannot be saved. In the Middle East, Israel, everybody talks Israel is here. It's not Israel. It's the people behind this hand. They're using Israel as much as they use anybody. They're going to use Israel to ignite a war. And this Arab uprising is giving the pretext for this war. And then Israel is going to make a tremendous preemptive strike. And then NATO and whoever's left, Russia, China, are going to move in to take over and set up a new world capital in Jerusalem, out of Rome and out of London, and whatever's left of Washington, D.C. This is what they want. They don't care about Zionism. Zionism is a, a metaphysical tool which they've been using to build this bonfire for a long time. They don't care about the Zionists. The Jesuits don't even care about the Jesuits. They'll sacrifice their own people. They don't care. They've done it before. They'll do it again. When they get what they want, they're going to create enough chaos, enough blood, enough Arab sacrifice, so that the whole world's going to scream for peace. And then Al Gaudiar is going to say, Here I am, your Messiah. Correct me if I said anything wrong, sir. There are ten major signs. I didn't use the word major because I don't see anything minor about the other ones <laughs> of the last day. Uh, and they're not given in the chronological sequence in which they will occur. <coughs> we don't know that sequence. Number one, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, help me, Kish. Number three? Uh, earthquake. The, the return of? The son of Mary. Mirza Gulam Muhammad was the son of a Punjabi woman. <laughs> Number four, Dukhan. Number five, Dabatul Ard. Number six, the sun will rise from Taman Sri UK. <laughs> the sun will rise from the west. west. Seven, eight, and nine, the three sinkings of the earth. One in the east, one in the west, one in Arabia. Number 10, that's the question. That a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly or hashal. You can stick to that methodology and look for a fire that can be extinguished with water. Or you can recognize the word fire here to be symbolic, representing, for example, a revolutionary fire. And if it's going to the place of assembly, which is Arafat, it's goodbye Saudi Arabia. Goodbye Saudi Arabia. <coughs> uh, I don't think we are now here in that. We still have quite some time to go before that can occur. Many people have asked, Sheikh Imran, how come you're still alive? <laughs> uh, you preach Islam the way that you do, how come you're still alive? Answer, had I been an Arab, I'd be long ago disposed of. Because I'm not an Arab, because I'm not an Arab, they have not as yet attacked me to eliminate me, to silence me. Yeah. The primary target of the state of Israel, because of Dajjal, is the Arabs. I, I mentioned it in my talk. In order for Israel to make a claim to rule the world, so that Pax Judaica might replace Pax Americana, and there should be some credibility to that claim, Israel must first establish firmly establish its political 
an economic dominion over the Arabs. I did say that in my talk. So the rest of the Arab world, I'm sorry, the rest of the Muslim world is only of peripheral importance to, to, to Israel. It is the Arab world which is of primary importance and that is why the attack will be on the Arabs. You know, I, <clears throat> I don't have the in-depth knowledge of the Quran and the Hadith and the traditions here. And every time I've looked at this, uh, I wound up coming back confused because there's an awful lot of confusion um, involved uh, in the interpretation here. So I think that one has to be very careful. Um, at, at one point, I, this is just my opinion, mind you, um, I, I think that uh, a certain degree of uh, success is already uh, reached and that uh, uh, the great uh, uh, individual known as uh, Salahuddin already took Jerusalem, you see. And then the subsequent generations of Muslims lost it. Uh, yeah, they held on for quite some time, but Salahuddin uh, did um, achieve this certain success and, uh, in uh, Jerusalem against the Christians, against this uh, Judeo-Christian uh, Gnostic alliance, because during the Crusades it was already Gnostic, it was already an alliance of that nature, even though if you look at the outward uh, historical reviews, there's not very much mentioned about the Jews, unless you go to uh, such places uh, in northern Italy where they financed the Crusades and brought down Constantinople along the way, because one of the reasons they wanted Constantinople destroyed is because they wanted evidence destroyed in the library at Constantinople. That's why they sacked the city. They didn't sack the city uh, because the uh, it was rich, they sacked the city, they were hired to sack the city uh, by the Jews in, um, uh, what's the name of that city up there? Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, in northern, in northeastern uh, Italy, who were actually uh, a combination of uh, Jews and uh, ancient Roman uh, uh, pagan families by that time. Um, and they ordered the sacking and the burning, they specifically ordered the burning of the library in Constantinople during that first crusade on the way to Jerusalem. And uh, they didn't care much about the riches. They wanted the library destroyed because the library held witnesses, held documents that would have destroyed the Roman church, what became the Roman church, would have destroyed its edifications. There may have been copies there, for example, of the original uh, uh, Gospels, which were written in Aramaic and Hebrew, not in Greek, not in Latin. There may have been an original copy of the Gospel of Barnabas, for example, in Constantinople. All of those things were destroyed. So Salahuddin counteracted that, and he was not an Arab. You see, he was from he was a, a Kurd from Persia. Okay, and so that particular um, uh, prophecy may have already been fulfilled. I don't know, Sheikh. I mean, I can That's just my my perspective on it. But I'll tell you this: the um, the Shia have a very strong hand. Not the Iranian people. They're great. I have many Iranian friends. They're intelligent, they're warm, they're industrious, they're well-read. They just don't know about the roots of their Shia religion. They don't understand it. It's not Islam as we understand it. It's actually a return to the occult Gnostic mystery religions. Because the Ismailis who founded it, they were occult magicians. And many of them were what we call crypto Jews. Crypto Jews. Okay. The Fatimids certainly were. And when you put them together and you put the animosity that's held between the Sunni and the Shia, 
you have the tinderbox ready to explode. And the Jews and those other magi of the Anglo-American uh, continuity there, they know this and they're exploiting that for all it's worth. They don't mind uh, letting Iran come up and rise up and arm itself because uh, they'll, get, they'll, they'll light the fire and those crazy Iranians, especially the ones who march down the street on Ashura and whip themselves like good Jesuits, okay? They're crazy. This is, this is satanic. They're possessed by jinn to do that. They put themselves into a trance. The whole nation is possessed on that particular day. That's like the celebration of Christmas. This is not an Islamic event. There's nothing Islamic about it. So all of these good people are being watched and observed, and these people know the people in Rome, the people in London, the people in New York, the people in Washington, D.C., the world, winding uh, the, the cogwheels of this thing. They know that those crazy people, when they start killing, they'll destroy themselves and destroy as many Arabs and Sunnis as possible. They want this. They want this. They wanted the Iran-Iraqi war. It was good for business. It was destroyed an awful lot of Muslims, created chaos. You still have the probably millions of widows and orphans there. I mean, this is not the way to build a country. You don't build a country with that kind of war. That's not uh, 11 years of massacring each other, sending young boys who don't even know why they're being sent. They're just told, oh, you're going to go to heaven? And don't mind, if you, I know you can't afford to get married, don't worry, because you're a Shahid and you're going to get 72 virgins. I mean, what young man who's a foolish ignoramus isn't going to buy that and say, hey, I'm going to heaven and I'm going to have me 72 virgins. Well, I'm an old married man right now and I don't know any man in his right mind who would want to be settled with having to take care of 72 virgins. Okay, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I'll defer to the shake on that, but this is my take and my response to that particular question. It's another tinderbox. They have tinderbox and tinderbox and tinderbox. They're all waiting to blow up. That's just another one. We have been taught by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam to always put a good meaning to things. To always think well of people. Unless and until we have evidence to the contrary. The revolution in Iran has produced a leadership which has overtly discarded these bad things about cursing the Khulafa Rashidun. I have myself attended conferences where Ayatollahs of the regime were present and when they spoke and they mentioned the name Abu Bakr they would say Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu with my own ears I've heard them they have themselves publicly affirmed that this Quran is complete. It's not an incomplete Quran. There's nothing outside of the Quran. Okay. And so we put a good meaning. We say these are Muslims. For them to be kuffar, not Muslims, you must not only have a fatwa to that effect, but also the fatwa must get ijma'a of the Muslim world, consensus. We've never had that consensus. Why? The evidence is there. No regime in control of the Hijaz has ever prohibited the Shia from performing the Hajj. No. They have performed the Hajj continuously and they still do to this day. Hmm? 
And so it is clear we do not have ijma that the Shia are kuffar, so I accept them as Muslims. Once I accept you as a Muslim, you are my brother. You are my brother. And I must think, <laughs> I must think well of you until I have evidence to the contrary. Hmm? The revolution in Iran has been consistently hostile to Israel, consistently in opposition to Israel, while Saudi Arabia has behaved as Israel's shoeshine boy, the Khadim al Haramain should rather be described as the shoeshine boy of Israel. It's time for me and for others to speak and to speak boldly and to speak clearly and to denounce, call a spade a spade. Here is Saudi Arabia and it's difficult for me to even use the word Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia emerged out of the garbage bin of history and I can't wait for it to return into the garbage bin. Because what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu left for us and we have forgotten it now because knowledge has disappeared. He left for us Darul Islam. He left Darul Islam. And now we go and vote in elections like cattle. Like cattle. Not knowing it's shirk. That the modern state which has come out of Europe to replace the Khilafah and to replace Darul Islam is built firmly on the foundations of shirk. Hmm? So there is Saudi Arabia which has replaced the Khilafah, which prevents the restoration of the Khilafah. There are only two forces in the world today which has consistently for the last 100 years, almost 100 years, prevented the restoration of the Khilafah, and that is Turkey. The Turkish Prime Minister should listen to me. And that is Saudi Arabia. These two are responsible. Okay, and here is Iran making an effort, making an it's an incomplete effort. They've not yet reached it, but we're trying to be return to an Islam Islamic model of a state. So I, as a Muslim, must look positively to your effort. Iran is also very supportive of the Palestinian people. I don't. I'm not surprised when they tried to make the Palestinians Shia. I would be surprised if they didn't do that because they are Shia. That's not surprising to me. And I'm not going to put a rope around the neck and, and string them up because of that. You're dealing with Imran Hussein now, not a schoolboy. And so, when I see the Western world, when I see the Zionist alliance const constantly attacking Iran, I have to come up with a more sophisticated level of analysis than that nonsense that this is all um, deception. Yes. Now, and my analysis is that they know what is the Shia faith and Dr. Zaid has spoken about it and what they want in Iran is something other than what the revolution has given. They want a militantly Shia regime in Iran. A regime in Iran with which Israel could establish some kind of a modus vivendi. Hmm? You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And they can't do that with this regime. So with all its defects, and this regime has defects. Well, so has Imran Hussein. I have defects as well. Huh? So with all its defects, this regime is a pawn in the side of Israel and the Zionist movement with all its defects. And what they want to do is to attack Iran, not so much to destroy the nuclear plants, that's part of the agenda. But the more important agenda is regime change in Iran. I am conscious of the fact that there is a hadith. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam prophesied that Dajjal would be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Persian shawls. 
And I think that is probably going to be coming after the attack on Iran, not now. I have one comment. When these were the friends of NATO and therefore part of the Zionist alliance, and when Washington and London and Jerusalem speak, they tell so many lies. And if they say to me that the sun is shining, I step outside and look up in the sky first <laughs> before I believe them. Thank you, Sheikh. That uh, is exactly what I would like to have said. <laughs> um, um, your question is about particulars. Okay. And uh, this is exactly what um, uh, the, the Lycian disciples would want you to dwell on. They want you to dwell on these things as if there's, because uh, uh, one of the things they want to uh, keep on uh, promoting is false hope. You know, uh, humans, we have this undying love uh, for ourselves and for each other. I mean, it takes quite a blow to the human psyche to uh, get to a point where you commit Harry Carry and lose face and you lose uh, hope. Um, but, so they hold this out, they hold this out as false hope, and they're always announcing another deadline or another end of the campaign, and then it's soon followed by something else. You remember when the Iron Curtain fell, we were going to have this wonderful release of all these funds to solve the problems of the world, and then we suddenly had a new enemy. Okay. So there's always a new enemy. There's always something else that's going to occur. There's always something else that's going to keep your eye away from the Gestalt perspective, away from viewing the entire mountain uh, as we began this with. They want you to look at the particulars. They're going to, they're going to want you to say, oh, see, the U.S. is doing something good. Uh, or so-and-so out of the Middle East that could convince them to pull their troops out of Iraq at last, at long last. Well, why is Iraq so important? Um, this brings us back to the Magi, uh, because it's the home of Babylon. <laughs> um, it's, you know, there is no Iraq. It was continu contiguous uh, territory. It was shared with Iran. This was Iran. This was ancient Persia. This was the, the land over which Khan's rule ruled. And that's why the Prophet said, if you don't accept Islam, you're going to be responsible for the sins of the Magi. They want to rebuild Babylon. Okay? Saddam Hussein was in the... Uh, he was actually beginning to do that, to reconstruct Babylon. Okay? This is very important satanic center for them because when, who was the, the righteous Persian king? I, I've forgotten his name now. The righteous Kisra. Persian king. Uh, he chased, uh, I've forgotten his name, he, he chased the, uh, the, the Babylonian Magi out of Babylon. He chased them into Greece and into the Middle East and into Turkey. They had to disperse themselves. They had to reseat their, 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 their Babylonian priesthood, which the Pope now represents, in a place called Pergamos. And that's right in the center of Turkey. Okay. They want this country back because it's important to them. It's more important to them than Jerusalem. Jerusalem has a global uh, significance because everybody's looking at it. And, Everybody's looking at uh, the, 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 the Temple Mount, and this has got global attention. It's got charisma, you know. But they really want Babylon. And Allah has declared that that place will never be rebuilt, if I'm not mistaken, according to some of the Old Testaments. So that's why they want the place. And in order to do that, they have to create havoc amongst the Muslims who were there. And they have to resurrect, and that's why you get an awful lot of airplay for the Kurds. Well, 
I have, I'm sympathetic to the Kurds too, but there's a part of the Kurdish population which are outwardly practicing, and everybody knows it if you know anything about the Kurds, they're, they're, they're practicing uh, serpent worshippers. They, they worship the devil openly. Okay. They're pretty significant to the, to the Magi community because they have some... Uh, well, they, they've got a direct line to Satan, to Jesus himself, in that area. This is ancient, ancient, ancient land. And it's not only the magicians who live from uh, generation to generation and practice their arts and then hand them on to their children. It's the jinn as well. And the jinn live longer than the men. And they've got a more complete memory. Believe me, the jinn are not uh, you know, slack when it comes to education. You get an individual who can speak about 15 different tongues and fluently, you can guarantee, you almost guarantee that that person is demon-possessed. Okay? Nobody has that kind of capacity. Very, very few people have that naturally or normally. They want Iraq and Iran because this is the ancient land where the son of Adam who murdered the first prophet carried out the first crusade. This is where he established his first mystery religions. It's all in that area along the Hindu Valley from Pakistan all the way over to Babylon. It follows those rivers, the Euphrates. So this is a very significant place for the devil worshippers themselves. Geography, uh, certain places, certain positions have a relationship to the magic and the power that is produced. They want this place. Babylon was destroyed, but the Jews stayed there. And they had half of the city all to themselves, quietly and in peace for the most part for a thousand years. And that's where they perfected the Kabbalah and the Talmud. Yeah. So, but they don't teach you this in... Islamic history now do this. The first thing that you must know when you're practicing jihad, you have to know your enemy. I'm here to tell you, you don't know your enemy. But it's part of my job to tell you, to teach you, to teach people like you who want to know what's wrong. Why can't we win? You can't win because you don't know who your enemy is. You don't know how they operate. You don't know how to defeat him. And you think that making dua and being ritualistic religious is going to do it. No, it will not. It will not. You're rolling out the red carpet for the wrong people. Okay? As long as you do that, there is no grace coming. Except for those individuals who qualify as true slaves of Allah and you're judged according to your intention. So this is why they want Iraq. This is why they want Iran. It's sacred territory for them. And they will try to rebuild Babylon, but Allah said it will never be rebuilt. And if they do start to rebuild it and it becomes to any degree of significance, it will be rest assured the earth will swallow it again. I want, I, I noticed some very glum faces amongst those of us here who are Arabs. <laughs> some very glum faces. Yes, so, yes. Uh, let me uh, offer a comforting word. Alhamdulillah, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> And that is that the destruction of the Arabs should not be uh, summarily uh, explained as divine punishment. There is certainly a part of punishment in it. But that's not just for the Arabs. It appears to me, and Allah knows best, that this is part of a divine planning. Yes. 
the, the, <laughs> the believers who are struggling. I got an email from Palestine <coughs> yesterday, yesterday, and he was roaring and raving and saying, why, 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 why must we suffer more? Sheikh, we've suffered so much already and you are telling us that there is even greater suffering to come. If you read that email, you'd weep. Yeah. This is part of the divine planning that you will not suffer anything for Allah's sake but that you will be rewarded. So today there are tears, tomorrow you will smile. Mm -hmm. So yes there is a divinely ordained destruction of the Arabs which is coming but that should not cause despair to yeah. set in. Rather it should cause our hearts to bow in submission mm. before the divine wisdom that in order for a greater good to be accomplished. What is that greater good? What is? Listen to this ayah and you will fill your heart with joy. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوَ الْعَذَابِ And your Lord has announced that He is now sending against them those who will inflict upon them continuously until the last day the worst possible punishment. That worst possible punishment was described in such a few words by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam, hadith of Sahih Bukhari. You will most certainly fight the Jews. And of course if you use a lazy man's defective methodology you will say the Prophet is speaking about all Jews. Oh no, that's foolishness. You don't, you don't, you don't develop scholarship like that. No. No, he's not speaking about all Jews. You will most certainly fight the Jews. You'll most certainly defeat them. And that time even the stones will speak. But before the stones speak, we have to suffer. We have to suffer. La tuqatilunna al Yahud, wa la taktulunna hum, hatta yakulul hajar. On that time, the stones will speak. Ya Muslim, as a Yahudi yun wara ifata ala faktul. There's a Jew hiding behind me. So tomorrow they'll be on the run. Today they're stamping their feet with such arrogance upon the earth and inflicting such horrible oppression and using deception to corrupt the world but tomorrow they'll be on the run and hiding behind trees and stones but tomorrow even the trees and stones will speak and say come and kill him mm -hmm. once upon a time when you had freedom in the United States I gave a lecture at the State University of New York in Stony Brook Wow. The Jews were sitting right in front of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I quoted this hadith. That was before 9 11. And they went to the rector, the vice chancellor, and they complained against me. Yeah. He's inciting the Jews to be killed. Mm -hmm. And our response was if we don't have the freedom to quote the Quran and to quote the hadith, do please tell us in this your United States of America. The Vice Chancellor could do nothing. He never even bothered to contact me. Hmm? So before this could come, this great triumph, I'm going to send against them. Hmm? 
I am going to send against them those who will inflict upon them continuously until the last day the greatest possible punishment. Before this can take place, in order for this to take place, he sent that vision to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. You must sacrifice your son. Are you prepared for that sacrifice? So Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam was, yes, I'm prepared for it. And Nabi Ismail alayhi salam said, yes, I'm prepared for it. And so the Arabs must also be prepared for it. The purpose of the Crusades is twofold. One uh, was a magical uh, purpose. There was something that they were searching for. Uh, and two was a political purpose. The Catholic Church uh, at that particular time, uh, it didn't really become fully Catholic until about the ninth century. It was losing its political grasp uh, uh, on the thrones of Europe. And uh, this was a very uh, nasty time to be a European. Um, uh, so they decided they were going to unify Europe under the Pope uh, by carrying out these crusades. Uh, and this Mm. This uh, cemented uh, a new era which then lasted for almost a thousand years uh, of the papal, well, 700 years or so, uh, until the revolution, until the uh, uh, reformation took place. Um, these were the dark ages uh, and the opening of the middle ages and the, in some places, the beginning of the um, what they call the, the Renaissance in, in some areas. The papal powers uh, wanted to consolidate their power. And now, when I say papal powers, what do I mean? I mean certain families that wanted to rule not just Italy, but all of Europe, uh, either directly or indirectly, through the office of the papacy, because this was how Nimrud did it in the old Babylonian days, you see, and um, uh, the Pope was sort of, sort, of, sort of a king and priest at the same time. They always sort of, it's a funny mixture, this sort of thing. But, you see, at this particular point, this fellow, Ormesius, long dead, had his disciples and they had uh, become a uh, a, a group of secret initiates that it, it even infiltrated Islam and uh, wrote uh, certain black magical treatises which eventually found their way to London in the hands of Queen, the first Queen Elizabeth and her uh, fellow uh, Magi who was a guy who translated it from the Arab to English and it became known as the Nekomakam. Well, there were books like this, and there were but not so much books as there were artifacts that they wanted. They were after, in particular, they were after the Ark of the Covenant. And the uh, Knights Templars went so far as to admit that they couldn't find it in Jerusalem. And uh, they followed the trail that led them all the way down to Aksum in uh, Ethiopia. And there they found something that may have been the Ark. Because, or maybe they found something that was inside the Ark because there are some rather inexplicable dwellings that they left behind that no one to this day can figure out how they carved the exact replica of cathedrals out of rock. I mean, there are cathedrals carved into the rock there that are every bit as magnificent as what, as what you see in Europe. But this is certainly not done by the hand of man alone. They found something. And whatever they found, we don't know what they found because it's a secret. And they're holding it. They took back to Europe and the king of Ethiopia was so worried about this. He went to Rome to warn the Pope. That was a long journey in those days. 
he took a, an entourage of about 70 people with him. And they took the time and the trouble to go all the way to Rome. And when the Pope heard about what was taking place and that at certain people under this particular Rosicrucian knighthood now carrying the Red Cross had certain artifacts in their possession, he and the King of France went to war against the Templars. And then they became the Freemasons later. There's a big long story. They found something. What they found, we don't know. And it's not really our business to know. If it was, Allah would make it known. You see, I'm not concerned about that. What, what I'm concerned about is the trail, the history that leads, that has led to the present day. These Knights Templars became what is now today the, the Knights of Malta, Salahuddin, um, who's the other fellow, uh, Suleiman the Great, magnificent. They tried, they did their best to wipe them out wherever they found them. They spared all the other Christians except for these fellows because they were magicians. They were just like the witch from Allah. See, he put them to the sword. Suleiman chased them all the way to the Isle of Malta. And then he had to withdraw. Okay? Couldn't take them down. They became the Knights of Malta after a fashion. And they are now the Knights of Malta today. This is the same group. They have very many branches, they have very many degrees, very many different, there's Constantinian order, uh, you know, the Arab kings belong to these orders. They belong to these orders. This, this is why judgment is coming, and this is why some of the people are angry, and they have a right to be angry, and they should not submit to such leaders, such leadership. This is the truth, and but it's not the truth that you get, you can openly speak about in academic forums or publish on the front page. <laughs> you see, it won't even it won't even get to the back page. They won't print it. Okay, now. Um, so they found something, and the political purpose served because after the Crusades, what happened was that the Jews in Italy and the Latin families, which had fled Rome and had all the gold and all the silver, they managed to enslave financially all of the royal thrones, the Celts, the Franks, uh, in, 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 in Europe and in England, who all those Christian kings who had to make a show of it, you know, Wear that cross and go get, go get Jerusalem for the good guys. <coughs> they were all in debt. They all became indebted because nobody can afford to practice that kind of war. I mean, you have to be Kublai Khan to do that. And guess what? They got gold from Kublai Khan because they, after the Crusades, one of the things that they did was they arranged of Kublai Khan to get all the gold, bring it to Italy, they uh, exchanged it for silver, then they controlled the gold in the silver markets in Europe. And they got further, for these people further into debt, and then began the first banking system. It all happened from during the Crusades. It's continued to the present day. They established this loaning on Riva at that particular time, and the fractional banking was already done then. See, now it's just more sophisticated, and we're all subject to it, one way or another. Now, I've forgotten your second question, but I think the, the Sheikh had, had better handle that. Uh, the, the second question was, uh, is it possible that by that time, when the stones are going to stick, that there be no more Jews left in the world who would be standing up in opposition? Israel and the Russian. I think it will be good strategy and wisdom on our part and will be greatly beneficial to us to speak hopefully, speak positively, to recognize that there are Jews in the world today who do stand up for oppression and who do condemn Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to express the hope that these will continue until that time 
when Israel is sent back to the garbage bin. Um, I, I just want to add something because the, the name of the city just came to me. It's Venice. Venice. The Venetian Jews, the Venetian Romans, they were not all Jews. Because what happened was, after Alaric sacked Rome, you see, what happened was that uh, one of the Roman uh, emperors declared women, all the women in the, the kingdom, in the empire, to be subject to him directly, not to their fathers, not to their husbands. And after that occurred, God wiped out the Romans, and he destroyed Rome. And when that happened, the Jews and the rich Roman senators who could escape, they all escaped to Venice. Yeah. Now that happened about 500 years before the uh, Crusades. And that was the period where it was really a dark age. Yeah. It was no man's land for the, for the most part. And so they consolidated their position in Venice because they had all the gold, they had all the silver that was to be had from Rome. They took the riches of Rome to Venice. Okay so that the Huns couldn't get them. You know, they got bits and pieces, but not the, not the majority. The, the, the people, the real Magi, the real Latins who practice human sacrifice and the Jews who practice human sacrifice, and believe me, they do it. Okay. They escaped to Venice. And then there was, there continued to be all sorts of, uh, uh, of, of uh, struggles between different clubs, different uh, factions, different covens, if you will, vying for power and authority. Venice was one of them, Florence was another one, other areas. But it was out of Venice that this occurred. The Venetians hired uh, the kings to sack Constantinople because the secrets that they wanted destroyed had been transferred by Constantine to Constantinople when the empire became initially divided. That was uh, a few hundred years prior. Yeah. That library had to be destroyed. And that's a significant uh, matter. And that's another reason why some of the, the Alexandrian library had to be destroyed as well. Okay, I'll end there. What they, you have to look at a lot of these things as uh, different disinformation. Yes, there are cycles. Um, and yes, these cycles have meaning and they have purpose, but their real meaning and their true purpose has long been lost, and uh, people are uh, sort of dwelling on the negative rather than the positive. For example, in the human being, every seven years we uh, enter a new phase of development, from our birth to age seven, and from seven to puberty, and from puberty to 21, and so forth, uh, and certain things occur during that developmental stage which are significant. Well, the, the same thing occurs in the Earth, the same thing occurs in the solar system, the same thing occurs in the universe, and there are rhymes, there are rhythms. But the important thing uh, to uh, note here is this cosmology, you know, it has a certain root uh, that you have to ascertain the scriptural basis. And if you don't have a firm uh, foundation in that scriptural basis, don't concern yourself with it, because uh, again, you'll get lost in some sort of particular, which is uh, uh, going to um, be nothing more than disinformation. Uh, something to, to make you anxious, you see. Um, uh, uh, and so, um, I, 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 is it going to occur? You know, people have asked me, well, you know, uh, uh, this Planet X was supposed to hit us last month. So I, somebody asked me that three months ago. Uh, is it going to happen, Doctor? Is it going to happen? And I looked at the author, and I don't know much about Planet X. I looked at it and I said, well, there's some viability here, but I don't know. I'm not an astronomer. It's not my field. But I looked at the origin, and I said, well, this person is not uh, scriptural. This is not allowed, and uh, they've been wrong before. <laughs> it's like the same fellow who prophesied the world is going to end, or the rapture is going to occur. They're all guessing. This is all false prophecy. This is 
coming from the mouths of demons. Okay? Oh, but they're human beings. Yeah, but they've been demonized. Their thoughts and their minds and their hearts are controlled by demonic ideations. So, a lot of what has been uh, added in that, if you, if you find yourself surfing around Planet X, surf away. You know, just dump all those websites. It's not going to help you. It, it won't help you understand anything at all. If there is a, a, a firm foundation in Islamic cosmology here, I have to defer to the Sheikh here. I've been so busy tracking these criminals down, I haven't had time to look at it. There, there is something to be expected, okay? You're, you're, you're correct that, but is it connected with this planetary... I don't know. I cannot say that. But you don't need to follow planetary cycles to be, in order to be... You, you don't need to be an astrologer. You don't need to be uh, Nostradamus, okay? You don't need to be Joan of Arc, please. We don't need that kind of approach. You can read the signs other times simply by your scriptural knowledge and by looking clear, clearly at what is occurring now. And you follow the patterns. There are patterns that occur. There are political patterns. There are human patterns. There are historical patterns. Uh, you know, even Calhoun establishes for us and other historians have established there is a cycle, there's a rise, and there's a fall. Right now, some of the rises and fallings are occurring a little bit more uh, a little quicker, quicker, quicker than they would have before, because everything's accelerated. I think that that's been prophesied as well. Is there something going to happen? You can count on it. Is it going to happen in 2012? Probably there will be a, a, a real global depression. Okay, uh, 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 something that will make 1933 look like a cakewalk. Okay, uh, and that's going to happen. Is there going to be some sort of a disaster? You can count on it. Whether it is Allah swallowing Arabia or uh, the earth uh, opening up and finally getting rid of that devil's den in Los Angeles, I don't know. I don't know, but you can count on something happening. And maybe there's going to be some sort of nuclear decimation of an entire American city. Maybe New York is going to disappear. Maybe it's going to be incinerated. I don't, but you can count on something bigger than 911 occurring sometime soon. 2012? Maybe, maybe not. The depression's definitely going to happen. So uh, don't, don't count on your finances. Get rice in your house, stock up, and you can run to the mountains like the prophet said. Go. I don't think I'm being quoted correctly here. I never said anything like that. What I have said is that what Harun Yahya has written could have, could have very much come out of the Israeli Mossad because of the similarity. Because of the similarity. And I accuse Harun Yahya, and I normally don't call names. This is not my style, not all. But I had to call this name of this, I don't know who he is, but he parades behind this name, Harun Yahya because of the grave danger that I perceived. In his book on Imam al-Mahdi and the end times, I think he wrote a hundred books in order to be able to put on this one. That was 99 or 95 percent that dazzled the world and here was the poison. To slip in the five percent the poison. Yes. That when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, as Muslims believe that he will return, that the Prophet has prophesied that he will return alayhi salatu wasalam, that the Jews would believe in him and the Christians would believe in him. La yu'minanna bihi qabla mawti, says the Quran. And since the Muslims already believe in him, that when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, according to this fanciful fairyland theory of Harun Yahya, Christians, Muslims and Jews are going to embrace each other in a fraternity, a wonderful fraternity. And since we are going to be having this lovely fraternity of Christians, Muslims and Jews in the end time, why should we not do it now? In other words, 
Why don't you be friends with Israel? This is false. This is not the correct interpretation of the Quran. When Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, I, I spoke in a synagogue in New Jersey before 200 Jews. And I quoted this verse of the Quran that when he returns, you will have to believe in him. You don't have any choice in the matter. And when you do believe in him at that time, it will be of no benefit for you. For he will give evidence against you and you go into the hellfire. I don't know where I got the courage from, I, but I still have that courage. But when the lecture was over, they surrounded me. I was surrounded by a whole sea of Jews. Of course, they never invited me again after that. <laughs> but they wanted to know why should we be forced to believe in something that we do not believe in, we reject. And my answer was that at that time the veils are going to be removed from off your eyes. And in the same way that when he was drowning, you know who I'm talking about, when he was drowning, he realized, I am not God. I am not God. And then he says, I now believe in your God, Banu Israel. Hmm? Similarly, at that time, you also will recognize that what you have been holding on to is falsehood. And what you have rejected and you have fought against and you have tyrannized and terrorized and oppressed, that is the truth. So you will now die swallowing your own vomit and having to accept that which you rejected. And you'll pay the price. وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا On on judgment day, he'll give evidence against you and you'll go into the hellfire. The actual event of the return of Nabi Isa Islam is not a wonderful fraternity, but rather the divine punishment now coming upon those who have rejected the truth and who have stood on the side of the oppressor. Not all Jews and all, not all Christians are like that, no. Hmm? And so instead of Harun Yahya talking about a wonderful fraternity, which is what the Mossad wants, he should quote the Hadith. At that time the, the stones and the trees will speak. You'll never hear Harunia here quoting that hadith. No. And they say, oh Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. I came to a negative opinion of Harun Yahya's work completely on my own. Uh, I never discussed this or this man uh, with the Shem at all until this, mo until this moment. Knowing what I know from the research and the books that I've written and uh, comparing that with the sensationalism uh, that is manufactured by the uh, Yaya Corporation, nobody can write a hundred books on their own. That's impossible. So he's got a team behind him. You have to look at you, know, you have to look at the facts from an even Calvinian perspective. What is possible? And a big bank account. Yeah, and a big bank account. You know, where does this guy come from? Okay. Now I'll tell you for a fact. Um, the present chair of the, uh, the Islamic uh, chair in uh, Alberta, even uh, Professor Ibn Al Rabi, he was here. A few. Some of you may know of him. A, he was an um, editor of the Muslim Journal for 20 years. Uh, Well-respected uh, scholar, in the, uh, in particularly in the Western sense. And he was on a money hunt. He was looking for money for his students, looking for scholarships uh, uh, to promote uh, uh, education. 
and uh, he went to Harun Yahya's house and uh, when he was ushered in uh, to the uh, mansion uh, he was met by uh, a number of very attractive young scantily clad uh, ladies uh, this is not an Islamic environment okay um, and uh, even now even our Rabbi, they, they, he told me this himself face to face when we discussed this man because I don't discuss Yahya. Uh, I went to Sister Saba's bookstore and I saw his words on the books and I was just introduced to her and so I, I didn't say anything, it was not my place. Um, but I wait, you wait for the opportunity. So the opportunity has now just arisen at this moment. If you've got any material from even uh, from this fellow Yahya, throw it away. Because it's, this has been the tactic, it's just as the Sheikh said, and I found this in my own research. These demons will give you 99% truth and they'll throw in 1% lie. Okay? And that lie will take you to hell. Guaranteed. That's how close they are. What did the, uh, the, Sheikh, uh, the king in Ethiopia say? There's a very thin line very thin line between us and he was held back by this thin line one percent jesus is god yeah. okay and we did that i would like to thank our sponsors and the sheikh uh, for uh, sharing this uh, moment uh, with me um, On a personal note, this is a continuation of my own Isra. Uh, when I became a Muslim uh, about just over five years ago, I lost everything I had at the age of 55, 56. I had to leave a place I thought was my home that I built with my life savings and uh, come to KL with the suitcase and my knowledge. That's all I had and my, my Islam. And what I found here was not the Islam I read about. The books, not the whole thing. So I, this is part of my Hitra. Um I began work then uh, to write what I have written. I had been actually studying these things for a number of years, but I hadn't written. And so I began the writing, and uh, from uh, being an unknown uh, entity, uh, a white foreigner who's actually your enemy, you know, in your, and people ask me, who's the, who's the enemy? I say, it's a white man. Beware yeah. the white man. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, be careful. I know, I'm a white man. <laughs> okay. um, this Judeo-Christian alliance has covered their heart. That's why they're, you have good Christian kids dropping bombs on innocent women and children all over the world. And they've been doing it for a long time. And they're white people. They're not here to help you. Right? And if they do say they're here to help you, check them out like I've been checked out. Okay. You know, examine them. Put them through the mill. Don't let them get off easy. Oh, you know, I've been put through the mill. So this has been a great opportunity for me. And I just want to say one thing about a follow-up seminar. I think that this would be a wonderful event uh, to initiate something of this nature on an ongoing basis because uh, people like yourself, you just represent the tip of an iceberg. People like yourself need to know and you need to see this uh, balancing act between uh, someone like myself who's brought up in a totally secular environment, okay, and the Sheikh who's been brought up in a completely different environment and has a traditional Islamic scholar, and the knowledge that comes with that. And you'll find out that the knowledge that I bring with me is somehow confirmed, you know, not by him, but through him, and uh, it's confirmed by the Quran. By the, I can confirm it to the Judeo-Christian uh, traditions. I know what was in there. That's why when I read the Quran, it made 
a bigger impact on me than it would on somebody else because I know what I, I knew what came before. Okay? So when I read that book, I found myself halfway through the book weeping. Then I come across the, the, the verse that speaks about the man who's a true believer weep, will weep when he reads this. And I had just started weeping. You can imagine what kind of effect that has on somebody like me who had already, I practically rewrote Genesis in, in, some, of my, uh, in some of my words. So this is a, um, I would like to, if we continue this and with God's permission and with the, the sheets of availability and myself, um, I would like to continue this, but on an invitation only basis, I do not want to open this to the public, because once you open this to the public, uh, you open yourself to all sorts of harassment, which is unnecessary. Uh, this is a bit like uh, Lao Tzu, okay? The students who would harass him, he'd take a stick and beat them until they ran away and didn't come back. He'd tell them, don't come back. We don't need students like that. Sheikh Iman and I, we're getting on in years, and we don't need to waste our time with people who really don't want to learn. Well, if we're going to do this, we'll do this with a, uh, a group of individuals who are motivated and a group of young people like you. You're the next generation. We're, we're going to be gone soon. Well, you need to carry this on. You're going to be facing fires that we're only talking about. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك ربنا وتعالي تياذ الجلال والإكرام اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا التبعه والله kindly show us truth as truth and that we might recognize it as truth and follow it and kindly remove the veils from off our eyes and show us falsehood as falsehood that we might recognize it and reject it Allahumma arina al-ashya akamahi Allah kindly show us things as they are we might not be deceived by what they appear to be Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusifun wa salamun ala al-mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Ameen